God is real. He's loving. He answers prayers. He talks through his prophets and the Holy Ghost when you haven't even asked. He is sending messages all the time. Jesus is the Christ. There really was an atonement. There really was. He is the Son of God. He was resurrected. He lives. He loves you and He loves me. I know that. And so I, I bear testimony that uh, the most ordinary of people anywhere in the world who, who think they don't matter, oh, they matter. God knows them and loves them, and it's just a joy. I'm Sarah Jane Weaver, editor of The Church News. Welcome to The Church News Podcast. We are taking you on a journey of connection as we discuss news and events of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. President Henry B. Eyring, second counselor in the First Presidency, will celebrate a landmark birthday on May 31st. Born in Princeton, New Jersey in 1933, President Eyring has dedicated his life to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. An educator by profession, President Eyring has served as President of Ricks College, the Church Commissioner of Education, in the presiding bishopric, as a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, and as a counselor to three church presidents. He and his wife, Sister Kathleen Eyring, are the parents of four sons and two daughters. President Eyring, it is so great to be with you today. Thank you so much for making time for us. I'm so delighted to see you. Well, I'm excited to talk about nine decades of your life, and I think the best way to do that will be to look back chronologically. Uh huh. And so can you just start from the beginning and share with us some memories you have of your childhood and youth? Childhood was in New Jersey in the time when because of World War II, we had to meet in our home. So the church was in my dining room every Sunday, and uh, there were never more than 10 people there. And that was the church. And so I grew up in the Princeton branch of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And I just thought it was wonderful. Uh, there was my brother and I were the entire Aaronic priesthood. My father was the only Melchizedek priesthood holder, and the rest were sweet widows, all converts, or if not widows, uh, their husbands would come. <laughs> and so that was the little group that sat in our house. That was church growing up, wonderful. And you probably learned that the church is people instead of a place or a chapel. To me, the church was some believing people, especially my parents. <laughs> my mother played the piano and led the singing by beating her foot. And my father conducted, and uh, I just, I thought it was, the church is wonderful. <laughs> but that's what the church was, yeah. Well, well let's talk more about your parents. Uh, what can you tell us about your parents? Your dad was a scientist. He was a chemist, a teacher at Princeton University. And my mother had been an educator. She was the chairman of a department at the University of Utah when she married my father. And he was only a postdoc, which means that he said he married up in, in terms of education. So she was, a, she was getting a PhD at the time she met him in Madison, Wisconsin. And so he was doing research and she was there getting a PhD. And they met at a Christmas party. Anyway, I won't give the whole story, but it's romantic. <laughs> <laughs> and the church and education was at the center of their lives and had been all their lives. The blending of education and the gospel was what life was from the time I was a little child. Well, they must have had high educational expectations of you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, it's interesting. Uh, Dad was excited. He wanted me to be a scientist. Uh, but uh, uh, my mother just wanted to be good. So I, I never got much of a pressure from her on the education side, but she was more interested in doing the right thing. And so that was the, the family life. That's probably why later I will go on with the story. We left Princeton and went to the University of Utah, where my father was the new dean of the graduate school. 
And my mother told us, I'm taking you home to Zion. And I didn't know what I, Zion was, but I came in to Utah. And uh, then began to find out what the church is like in an organized way. But uh, again, that was sweet because the people that I met were marvelous. When we moved, we moved in and lived with, with Spencer W. Kimball, whose wife was my dad's sister. So I arrived in Zion as a guest, living in the house of Spencer W. Kimball, and it, I looked like Zion to me. <laughs> yeah, it was, anyway, that's growing up. When do you remember first having a testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Don't remember not having it, ever, really, ever. In my youngest childhood, I had spiritual feelings uh, that have lasted with me over, over all my life. So I have no memory of not knowing that it was true. Well, and if you're attending sacrament meeting in Princeton in your living room, yes, uh, where were you baptized? How did that unfold? Yeah, the, the only font in the area was in Philadelphia. And by the way, it was the only chapel east of the Mississippi at the time. Anyway, they took me there. There was a font. And that's one of the ways I know that I had a testimony because I was baptized in that font in, in Philadelphia. And on, on the way home, to Princeton, I was standing in the back of the car because it was that little a car and I was that young. And I remember being, thinking, uh-oh, the free ride is over. I knew that that baptism was real. But it, it's interesting, it had the effect of saying, now you better be careful because now you're responsible. I knew the freedom of childhood of whatever you do is okay. I knew it was real. I knew that I had made a covenant with God and that I was now responsible. And I was just a little kid. And by the way, if there's a thing that is still with me at age 90, is again the same feeling of saying, uh-uh, this is really serious. This is really serious. This is with God. Jesus Christ is Jesus Christ. And that baptism was a covenant. And I'm under covenant. and. Good news, bad news, in the sense that I know the Lord will help me because that's one of the things the Lord does, but at the same time, responsibility. When people say, you know, are you looking forward to the, <laughs> the judgment? You know, I'm 90 now, you say, give me a little more time. Give me a little more time. Because I had from the time of childhood a, a feeling of what the Lord expects is very great and that he's real. And while I felt that he was loving, my mother kind of was the example. I thought that she loved me, thought the world of me, but there were high expectations, spiritual expectations. And really, I'm not joking. People say, oh, I can't wait to see the Savior. Uh, I'd like to wait just a little while. There's some things I haven't done, and some things that I'd like to do. Now, that's a very personal thing. A lot of other people don't feel the same way but that's me. When you think of this baptism, it sounds like it's this hinge point in your life where you realize I'm part of this church. And it's, and and it's real, mm -hmm. and it's real. There is a Jesus Christ, there's a heavenly Father, and there are rules, and there's a law, and there's great joy possible if you live the covenants that you've made, yeah. Were there other hinge points in your life, other decision points? that set you on a path that made a difference for you? Yeah, probably one pattern. I got a feeling of what the Lord wanted me to do, call it revelation, about myself and about the future from time to time, and those made the most difference. I have to be careful of which example to give, but one would be uh, the time when I first left home and uh, I graduated from the university and I went in the Air Force and I was alone there and given a terribly difficult assignment in the Air Force, uh, way beyond my own abilities. And I, I thought, I don't think I can do this. And then I got a feeling of saying, well, serve the Lord and you'll get the power to do it. And so the whole time I was in the Air Force, I was a district missionary for the full two years. And I would go do my very difficult thing in the 
every night I'd go out and, and do missionary work. And I look back now and that little feeling of saying, well, okay, of all the things I've got in front of me, if I can just serve the Lord, the other things will work out. That pattern occurred time and time and time again, a feeling of, of the Lord saying, you know, what you really ought to do is do this. And then your other troubles will, will take care of that. And it, it happened when I got into Harvard Business School and my grades were not up to it. And I, you know, I was a physics student. I didn't know anything about business. And I got there and I thought, I'm over my head. And within a few weeks of arriving at the Harvard, they called me into the district presidency. Yeah. And so while the rest of the students were doing work all the time, I was out running over New England and uh, the Lord took care of it. I did okay. Uh, and same kind of thing after I finished at Harvard. I got a job as a teacher at Stanford University and that was over my head. And I was called as the bishop of the Stanford Ward. And every time that I, I got a little nudge to do something the Lord would have me do, then he seemed to take care of everything that was over my capacity. I've had a lifetime of having, <laughs> like, if things are tough, find out what the Lord wants, line yourself up with that. And President Hinckley always used to say, Hal, things will work out. <laughs> and it was true. I would say that every time I was in a, some difficulty of hard things, and I turned to say, no, let's, it doesn't make sense, but let's do the thing the Lord would want. And then, you know, when you, when you ask, how do you explain your success? I'm just amazed. <laughs> I would say every time I would turn to try to serve him, then he somehow would take care of things. And I, I think that's about when you say, where the hinge pit? Every time I made a choice to, when I was there at Stanford, I became the bishop of the Stanford Ward. <laughs> you know, while I was struggling to try to survive, and I survived. And by the way, I spent so much time doing it that when I finally went to Riggs College from there, the dean of the Stanford Presidency School said, well, good, Hal is now going to give all his time to his church. So you know what, he was watching me. All the, you know, what's this guy doing when he's putting so much time into his church? My guess is the hinge points were many times, but if they have anything in common, it was that when I was in a jam a little bit over my head, I found a way or the Lord found a way to let me serve him. And then things, things will work out. So when people say, are you proud of your career? I'm amazed <laughs> in the sense that uh, it wasn't that I set out to do things. It was that I was going to do hard things, but I somehow was always nudged or invited to sort of say, let's bet on the Lord. And that worked. So I, I don't know why I was blessed, but I was blessed. Well, and I want to talk about the path you chose for your education. Yes. Because you're the son of a famous scientist yes. Yes. who actually studies physics as an undergraduate student. Yes. And then goes to business school. Yeah. What happened? <laughs> Again, you hate to be this honest because you have to talk about your own shortcomings. But uh, my father wanted me so much to be a physicist. But I worked at it and I worked at it. But it, physics is like music. Some people have an ear for it and some people don't. It was one of the professors who knew my dad, of course, well. He said, Hal, I looked at your exam paper and you don't seem to understand you can't see the curl of a vector. I said, a curl of a vector was just a mathematical thing to me. So you can't see the curl of a vector? He said, well, then maybe you better get out of physics. Because <laughs> my father in his science could see, he saw molecules. So I know there is an art and I didn't have it. And so then I graduated in physics, but then I went into the Air Force. And then after the Air Force, I said, what am I gonna do? I can't go back to physics. I'm no good at it. Oh, I heard of a place called the Harvard Business School. I didn't know a thing about it and didn't care a thing about business, but I knew that there was a school and that they sometimes liked people with a science background. I got in. 
And when I got there, I found out I was the lowest scores of all the, you know, the exams that were coming in. But I did very well. And why did I do very well? Because I was called into the district presidency. <laughs> oh, and gone every weekend when the others were working. Uh, and so really, when you say, how did I get out? Of, I got out of physics because I knew I had to get out of physics. And then why did I go to business school? I don't know. It's because it looked like something I could do. But what was happening was what the Lord was, was working the thing. You see, because then by going to the Harvard Business School and getting a doctorate, and then again, the Lord moved me to, to Stanford. And you say, why to Stanford? Well, it was because I was going to be the bishop of the Stanford Ward. You know, so my, my life, is, as nearly as I can tell, in terms of career, was just what's possible. And knowing that, and Dad always told me, he says, well, you'll never be good at anything unless it's what you think about when you don't have to. And I knew that, boy, that wasn't physics. And it, it really wasn't this, the business. But when I, I thought about it, my church work, I thought about when I didn't have to. And he said, you'll only really accomplish if you can get something that you think about when you don't have to. And it's true, the Lord was leading me along, finding chances for me to serve him in a way that I thought about it when I didn't have to. And while you're at Harvard, the most amazing thing in your whole life happens because you meet your wife, Kathleen. Yeah. I was uh, at Harvard, age, well, I won't say how old, an older, with a hairline getting to be like I have now, still a bachelor. I wanted to marry, but I knew that I just had a feeling that I ought to wait. And uh, then one Sunday, I was speaking at the up in Ringe, New Hampshire, and I saw a girl, and uh, a feeling came into me. That's the best person you've ever seen. And it was very specific with the words, that's the best person you've ever seen. And that night, back in Cambridge, I was sitting on the stand as a member of the district presidency, and that girl walked in, who I didn't know who she was, and she sat down. I know right where she sat on the <laughs> well, She sat down. And I turned to my president. It was Wilbur W. Cox, who was the man that President Nelson activated years before the, the story. It is the same man. I was his counselor. And I turned to Bill Cox and I said, Bill, do you see that girl sitting there? And he said, yes. Sir. I said, I'd give anything to marry her. <laughs> if I could be with her, I could become the best thing I ever could be, I ever wanted to be. And didn't know who it was, and went and got to the branch clerk and said, hey, you know, a new girl just arrived. Is there any chance? She, oh, yeah. She just arrived for summer school, and she sent her membership. Now, 21-year-old girls don't send their memberships, but she sent her membership ahead. And so I got in touch with her. I won't go through the, all the stories with that, but, but the Lord, uh, again, because I was up there giving that talk, uh, then he could do something for me and meet her. And again, every good thing that's come has come at least apparently as a byproduct of trying to, to do it for the Lord because you loved him. So anyway, that's the story. And Sister Iring was, is every bit your academic equal and a pretty good tennis player back then? Well, she was a great tennis player. In fact, our first date was tennis. And she had beautiful strokes. And I'm embarrassed to say that I was supposed to be getting a doctor's degree, but I was playing a lot of tennis. And so I was, I thought, oh, good, I'll, I'll show off. And so I cleaned her, you know, uh, we had 6-2 or something in the first set, and we changed sides. And as I passed her, I said something funny and witty, and she wouldn't even look at me. And she just walked past me and went to the other end of the court and began tap her racket. Down. And I thought, hey, remember, this is my first experience with her. I said, ah, she's irritated. She'll get worse. I know enough about athletics. That, you know, when you get under pressure, she'll get worse. And uh, she began to hit that ball and just hit the court. It just took me apart. And after it was over, I said, oh, 
when things get tough, she gets better. <laughs> and now, see, we're married for 60 years, and she's a pretty tough situation now, and she's getting better. <laughs> yeah. But it was interesting that, again, uh, it was a nudging from the Lord. He gave me a feeling for the future. Little things that you know are the Lord giving you little insights, either about people or about the future. Those are sprinkled through my whole life. And so I, I have a very real feeling that the, the future is going to be just fine because he's kept me alive. <laughs> so instead of looking backward as a 90-year-old, I'm looking forward. What you know is if you can just line up, well, I'll give a story on that too. When I was named the president of Ricks College, I had never been there before. I didn't know anything about it. And I was a professor at Stanford. And uh, I went to the first meeting of the Board of Education. And President Harold B. Lee was in the chair. And he said, Brother Iring, we'd like to hear your acceptance speech. I, are you accept? I didn't know anything. What about it? And he said, uh, one of here, and here's my acceptance speech. I don't know anything about Ricks College. I don't know anything about how to run a college, but I know this. It's the Lord's School, and I'll find out where he wants to go, and I will line myself up, and I will not fail. <laughs> and uh, President Lee said, that's the best acceptance speech I've ever heard. But he wasn't saying it was a great speech. He was just saying, you've got it right. If you can get yourself in the Lord's service, line yourself up and say, I'll do, I want to go anywhere he goes. You will not fail because he will, and it happened, and it's happened in my life. Again, I have to be careful telling this story because you say, well, other people don't, you know, often get that much help. Why I have that much help, I don't know. The nice thing is I know it isn't me. The, the Lord is somehow, for some reason, telling me if I'll just serve him as much as I can, best I can. As President Hankley used to say, things will work out. And it happened again, you see. Well, you marry your sweet wife yes. and, and you head to Stanford and it's sunny and warm and you live by your in-laws, which was wonderful. Yes. Were there some lessons that you learned from your in-laws as you were in close proximity with them during those years? In those years? <laughs> Yes. Mostly what I learned, though, was because of something that had happened. When I was sealed by President Kimball, uh, he said, live so that when the call comes, you can walk away easily. And when he said that, I saw a hilltop. I don't have a painting over here, but I've got a painting. A hilltop, absolutely clear in full color. Live so that when the call comes, you can walk away easily. So I get married, and, and my father-in-law takes me out of the countryside in Atherton, and we start up a hill, and I turned to Kathy and said, this is the hill I saw when President Kimball said, live so when the call comes, you can walk away easily. So what happened? My father-in-law, when we got up to the top of the hill, said, oh, we want you to live in the guest house. We're buying this property. We lived there for 10 years. But what I learned, when you say, what did I learn from my in-laws? First of all, it was the nearest thing to heaven you've ever seen. Wonderful people who took care of us. But what I learned during that period of time is every day I'd come home from Stanford and I'd say, well, should we play tennis or should we swim? What do you want to do? Because we're not going to be here. And 10 years later, 10 years later, Neil Maxwell calls me on the phone and asks me if I would go to Rick's College. I'd never even heard of it. But the Lord had prepared me, you see, by saying, we didn't know what it meant. Live so that when the call comes, you can walk away easily. And I was shown that hilltop, which if you think about it, my father-in-law didn't even know that hilltop existed. So uh, don't tell me, how can the Lord know the future? But it was not a question. He showed me that hilltop. And so that 10 years later, when it was time to go to Rexburg and live in a single white trailer, we were ready because the Lord had said through his prophet, live so that when the call comes, you can walk away easily. So you go to Rexburg 
and you face those cold, long Rexburg winters. <laughs> it was the worst winter they'd had in years. <laughs> they gave us a, we, no house, so we had a single wide student trailer. That's where we lived with three little boys for the first year. And the snow would come, the wood blow under the door. And so I can remember the snow going across the floor in that trailer. But Kathleen, we went from the beautiful thing we lived in California to that. She never complained one time because the Lord had already told her, live so that when the call comes, you can walk away easily. So she knew she was on the Lord's track and it was okay. She never complained. So that single wide trailer was one of the sweetest times I've ever seen. But it's because the Lord had said a little, I call it revelation or whatever it is, but he showed the way so that you'd be comfortable. And every time you get a new assignment in the church, your wife is right there supporting you. What did that support mean to you throughout all the years of your marriage? Everything. In the sense, again, I don't know other couples, so I don't know how it works, but uh, she never said, "Atta boy." She never said, great talk. In fact, even when I was in the 12 and in the first pregnancy, the most thing she'd ever say after it was over is, I felt something. So it's a kind of a support of, as if she just always knew. So not supporting me. By the way, I always got the feeling that it was really the Lord she cared about, <laughs> you know. So I never looked for approval because I never got it. But you kind of just... It was what you felt was the support you got, that she was pleased to be in that single wide trailer. People often ask me, what did you used to talk about? I can't even remember. Uh, we always just pleasant things, uh, things will work out. And uh, she, for instance, never gave a talk. Most of the wives of heads of the institutions, they are almost like co-presidents and are very public. I think she gave one talk the whole time over his Rick's because the young women students asked her. But other than that, very much just, she was just always there, but not nothing in public, always doing nice things and taking care of the family. In fact, I now, as we're getting down to the end of life, I'm saying, you know, I never appreciated her enough because she was just always there, just always, no complaints, no anything. And uh, I guess I felt, well, that's the, just the way things are. Now I look back and I say, a miracle, miracle. It, it was just always, it was like we were one person. It's hard to describe. And that now with her present condition, she hasn't been able to speak for some time. And it's interesting. You say, well, it was, it was never what she said. <laughs> it was just her. <laughs> you know, she was... She always wanted to do the right thing and always giving you the feeling that if you did the right thing, that'd be just fine with her. And so I want to talk more about that. After 60 years of marriage yeah. and her constant support of you and this working together, she's faced some health challenges yep. and you've had the opportunity to care for her. Yes, yes. Although it's been easy. Look, I go up to sing and pray with her every morning and I do every night. Not to be good, it's because I want to be there. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just what, you know, singing with her, praying with her, that's all. And so I, I would say uh, if there's anything that's happened from this illness, it's made me appreciate more how easy she's been to help me all the time. And she can still do it when she can't even speak. When I go up there and sing with her in the morning, you know, and pray, it lifts you again. But it, it's, it's hard to describe, and it's probably not even a good thing because other couples, everybody works out differently. But this one is one where I, I would think that probably the closest thing I can think of it is what I try to have is in a relationship with the Savior. And that is, uh, I think of him as so wonderful, and I think of her as so wonderful, that just anything that brings me closer to them makes me happy. 
And I don't compare it to the Savior. Don't misunderstand me. But, but the, the feeling, the relationship is one of, uh, oh, you know, when the Savior says, walk with me, <laughs> and inviting you. To, I've always had the fe feeling that Kathleen's been a little the same way of, of uh, you know, and now she won't speak, but she does smile now and then. <laughs> and uh, it's the smile, you see, of sort of saying, we're still in this together. And uh, by the way, if I ever have, if I ever have, I haven't had it often, but a feeling of the Savior smiling, you know, uh, maybe that's m too much to ask for, but I tend to think, oh, I, I hope that just not like she will still occasionally smile. It's a smile that, uh, uh, a smile of approval. It's a smile of approval. And oh, you'd, you'd like that. In fact, if I could say one thing that's come from this whole, I've told these stories, you see, of trying to serve the Lord. The sweetest times have been occasionally feeling his approval. And I can still feel that from her, even with uh, her great limitations. Talk about raising children uh -huh. with Sister Eyring yes. and what it means for you to be a father. It's been a joy. It's felt all the way through that the Lord was, was helping with these children. They're all very different. But I would say I haven't thought of myself as, you know, how do you be a good father? It was just always a feeling that uh, I love them. It's funny if you talk to them about what kind of a father I was, I don't even know what they'd tell you because I was never working at it as something that I had a, a technique. It was just with them, it was like it was with her. It was fun to come home. <laughs> and, uh, you know, what can we do together? And uh, I think of Father Lehi or think of Adam. I mean, you know, by and large, most folks uh, struggle. And I don't, I can't remember struggle. I can't remember struggle. Well, and even before your children are raised, your, your daughters are quite small. You're called into full-time church service, first doing church education and then in the presiding yep. bishopric. Those had to be very, very busy years. Mm -hmm. But the way to say it is, through it all, as those kids were growing up, there was Saturday projects Whatever my life was like, Saturday projects. And with the boys, the, the first were boys. And we, it was projects. We built things. We built things. And then come on, two little girls. And I, after about, a, uh, they got to be about two. Daddy, is there something we could do without a hammer and a saw? And, <laughs> and so I began, I began baking bread. And today I'm still baking bread at home. I, uh, because the girls could do it together, so we, we bake bread. President Eyring, I also want to ask you about another extracurricular activity that you have engaged in over the years. You and your wife met and spent time together early in your relationship playing tennis. We've all seen your beautiful, beautiful watercolors. Can you talk to us about some of the lessons that you've learned from these extracurricular activities? And maybe even talk about some of the spiritual lessons that have come as you have created art and watercolors. Tennis and art. <laughs> Athletics, tennis being an example. And uh, I've done art. And it's interesting that uh, tennis, if it's played well, is an art. It's a creative thing. You don't just repeat somebody else's tennis stroke. You develop it your own. And I'm doing this thing in watercolor. It, you're trying to get a feeling. It's one of the things, for instance, I'll sometimes think, I think I want to paint right now. And I thought, well, no, I can't paint unless I have a feeling. Either love, there's a feeling of beauty as well. There's a joy in creation. I don't want to be like somebody else. I want to be like whatever it is the Lord wants me to be. And that's, it's unique. I'm not trying to be like somebody else. I'm trying to be whatever this thing is the Lord's trying to create in me. And I, again, there's a searching kind of a thing in art. 
And it, frankly, in tennis as well, it's not whether you win. Golf is even worse, by the way. Yeah, you know, I was given my first set of golf clubs when I was 65, and Brother Edgley, who was a good golfer, said, oh, you poor person, you won't live long enough to enjoy it. And what he was saying is there's a kind of a, I haven't been there yet, but I've watched good golfers. When they hit that, it looks like it's, it rises. You know, and I haven't figured it out yet. And I'm the same way with watercolor. So I do the watercolors searching for something that I don't know quite what it is, but it's not like being somebody else or painting like somebody else. It's not playing tennis or golf. There's something in the doing of it itself that you're searching for, some better thing. And I'm the same way you see spiritually as I don't want to be like somebody else. I want to be like whatever it is the Lord. He made me, and he made me for something. I don't know what it is. And you see, Dad was that way about his chemistry. Who could love chemistry in mathematics? But he just went to hell. He's an old man now. He's world famous. Now I understand how to teach calculus. But he was always looking and always sure he wasn't there yet. People would say, well, why doesn't God tell us how to you know, create things and do things? And he says, well, we, we wouldn't understand anyway. But he wants us the fun of trying. And I was with him in, in New York once when someone attacked him and said, Professor Iring, you've been on the other side of this question before. And he began to laugh. I thought he'd get mad. He began to laugh. He said, of course. He said, I, I've been on every side of this question I can find until I finally find out what it's all about. And I think that's how we, how we are religiously when people say how they love the Savior. You know, I love him. I say to myself, well, I, I'm working on it. <laughs> I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet. And so the art is, it's a search. You know, there's some beautiful thing. <laughs> that isn't it yet. But I'll try it again. I've got a thousand watercolors. You know, little ones. A thousand of them. My secretaries have filed them away as if they're precious. They're not precious. They're a search. <laughs> you know, I look at them and I say, oh, that's, yeah. But you say, I'll try again. I'll try again. And now my body's getting where I can't try golf anymore and I can't try tennis, but it's the same thing as, it's what life is. I mean, we're supposed to become like God. You know, and people say, become like the Savior. Well, come on. But I, I can try a little more today. And it's a joy to try. But the art is funny. How I got into it, I don't know. Searching. By the way, the, the thing we're talking about that is, you got to be careful because there's all kinds of things you could, you know, I could try to be a musician or something. You, you can't do it all. But I think the idea of, of a little struggle of trying to rise and do something a little more beautiful and better, that's in us. I think in a way, I feel sorry for the people that do have a particular talent and then spend their whole lives just on that talent. It's probably better to be all over the place a little bit the way I am, is to say they all have the, the desire to, to do better. I'll, I'll probably go do watercolor today now, you know, just to, to try. And I've got a thousand of them. I don't like many of them. But I remember the process, and it was fun trying. You know, in fact, it's related to what we've been talking about. I've had all these callings in the church. I have got any of them right. But uh, thanks for the ride. And uh, it's as if the Lord is saying, well, yeah, I'll give you another one, I'll give you another one. Uh, try. And I appreciate that. I mean, when, when somebody say, do you feel honored? Uh, no, I feel blessed. The Lord said, I'll, I'll let you struggle. It's something new. When we get on the other side, my guess, it just goes on. You know, people think, what's it going to be like over there? A lot of what it's like here. You know, perfection is over a long, I don't know how long it goes. But I, I still am not anxious to get over there. I, 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 I like it here. 
and those years in the presiding bishopric in yeah. the 70 and the Quorum of the Twelve had to be so preparatory for what you're doing now. What are some of the things that you learned or that impacted you as you served the Lord full time? Yeah, well, a few things. But I think by and large, it was just the idea of sort of saying, give it the best you can, trust me, try to find out what I want. I don't see my life in, in terms of this really prepared me for this. And the whole process of just trying to do the best you can and trusting the Lord and being nice to people, it fit all of them. And each thing taught you to do it in a new setting. But you're really learning the same thing over and over again. If you say, well, how different was being in the bishopric versus a, I was also a 70, by the way, a commissioner of education, all those things. I was commissioner of education, I think, for 17 years. And you say to yourself, good heavens, you know, what prepared you for that? I don't know. It was just like everything else. Find out what the Lord wants, do it, and enjoy it because he'll be in it with you. If you ask me if any one of those was a bad assignment, no. Find out what the Lord wants, try to do it, trust him, and be nice, be kind, and, and then things will work out. Well, and it has given you the opportunity to see his work and his church oh and my. his children across the world. Oh my. You know, and what I, what I realize is, is two things. One is it's incredible, the people who have hard times, how well they do. Poor, born into difficult circumstances. The faith of the average Latter-day Saint is absolutely remarkable. Everywhere you go in the world, in poverty, in wartime, whatever, you, you are amazed and with things not working out in health and other kinds of things. The faith and the goodness of the Latter-day Saints is just remarkable. I, the other thing as I've learned is that the prophets of God really do get revelation. The Lord is leading his church to a degree and in detail in a way that's constantly amazing. Every time I come out of the presence of one of the prophets, I say, oh, my, it happened again. You can just see the Lord is not telling them exactly everything, but enough that he is, he is leading his church through human beings. And as a member of the First Presidency, you've had the opportunity to observe and yeah. uh, work closely with three prophets. Yes. I'm hoping you can share with us a little bit of your feelings for each one. Yes. Let's start with President Gordon B. Hinckley. Actually, this wasn't going to be difficult. The prophets are very different. I mean, they're like we all are. I mean, they're very, very different. So when you say, maybe the way to say it is, do I see differences, tremendous differences? They operate differently. But what they all have in common, all have in common, is clearly, clearly they get revelation. Remember President Monson, for instance, when he had some health problems. Well. Everyone has, uh, and you say, well, even in the midst of the, anything, I was able to see the hand of the Lord guiding them. Almost what the story you see that I'm telling about my own experience, it, you see in them. President Hinckley, he was fun. Oh, he was fun. He, he said to me several times, Hal, considering your parents, you ought to be a lot better. Now, he knew my mother and father, but he was always that, you know, come on. He was wonderful. He was wonderful. And then President Monson, go to the rescue, stories after stories. He was really that way. He remember he talked about the widows. He went to every funeral of the, of the 80 or whatever one does. That was him. Unbelievable. I mean, so all of them had revelation. All of them had love, but they expressed it in different ways. And then President Nelson, I cannot describe to you what it's like to watch him operate. I've known lots of very bright people, and he's one of the brightest people I've ever known. But I've never known anyone who was more kindly and more able to see the good in people. Just amazing. He gets revelation. He gets revelation. 
and yet he will turn to you and say, uh, I, you know, I, I, I woke up this morning and I wrote this down. What do you think? <laughs> and what you know is he's, he has no doubt, but he always, he lets people feel that they can participate with him. Uh, I think the reason he asked you, what do you think of this, is not that he, th that he thinks I can improve it, but he wants me to get the revelation so I can, it can be mine with him. He has a way of including people and trusting them that's just phenomenal. Uh, and I, to live in that glow uh, is, uh, and the whole church is feeling it. The whole church is feeling it. Look how many Tim of the brethren quote the living prophet. Look, look at every conference talk. And the, the last thing that he said is because they can feel literally that he is speaking for the Lord. But again, same with President Hinckley, different style, but the same thing. And frankly, boy, I never had a doubt one minute, even as he was getting a little older, I knew he was the prophet of God. I knew him just as sure as could be that I listened to his littlest words with the thought that I, I, I may hear the voice of the Lord if I just listen. So what I learned is to, to listen and also to, to feel through them the Lord's love. And you can feel that. I don't know if you do, but if you listen, any, I can listen to old recordings of Ezra Taft Benson, whom I also knew, and others. And I just come back again. I can tell. I can feel the Lord's love through him. I can feel the love. And prophets have that gift. And having that feeling that uh, if I'll listen carefully, I'll get revelation by paying attention to a prophet of God. And it's just a joy. In fact, I asked him before we, I came here, he said, well, you know, what should I do? He said, well, just bear your testimony. And so I'll bear my testimony. And I have done that through this whole story. God is real. He's loving. He answers prayers. He talks through his prophets and the Holy Ghost. When you haven't even asked, he is sending messages all the time. I bear my testimony to you, that's true. Jesus is the Christ. Those feelings I had when I was coming from my baptism, that's real. There really was an atonement. There really was. He is the Son of God. He was resurrected. He lives. He loves you, and He loves me. And I know that. I know that. And the Holy Ghost, I've already borne testimony about the Holy Ghost. <laughs> my nickname is Hal. So uh, uh, what's fascinating is I've had revelations where I think I've heard the name Hal. So <laughs> there's the Lord and Heavenly Father and the Holy Ghost. They know my name. They even know my nickname. <laughs> they really do. Yeah. And I, I know that. And so I, I bear testimony that uh, the most ordinary of people anywhere in the world who, who think they don't matter, oh, they matter. Uh, God knows them and loves them. He weeps when they don't do the right thing because he knows he can't bless them because he, there's a law. There's, and he's bound by law too. Uh, so it's interesting where I, 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 I love him, I know he loves me, but I know this is the role, <laughs> and, and that's why I say uh, I'm not ready to go yet. I, I'd like to, I want to be sure I've done everything I can to have the atonement work so that I, where I have not done all the law asked, I may say, have some forgiveness. Because none of us are perfect and none of us have done everything, but we need the atonement. And I have faith that if I'll just keep trying to serve the Lord, that the atonement will work in my life. Well, we have one final question. Sure. When you look back on your life after 90 years, mm. is there one thing 
that you know now? You can't pick one. I think I have to pick the three. I am a child of God, of Heavenly Father. He loves me. Jesus Christ really paid the price of all my sins and leads this church. And he does it with the Holy Ghost, and that's real. The Holy Ghost. We don't give him enough credit. And I, I think, yeah, I, I'd end on that note, is to say, if I have a regret, and if I think I'll be in some difficulty unless I take care of it, it's to not have appreciated what I've just said to you. Have I really appreciated enough being a child of Heavenly Father? Really, if I appreciate it enough, am I grateful enough for the atonement and the service of the Lord Jesus Christ? And am I grateful enough for the time of the Holy Ghost to say, hell, <laughs> and told me what to do or what truth was? I think the great sin is ingratitude, and I'm working on that. And I appreciate the chance to do what I'm doing now. You see, by bearing my testimony, I'm at least expressing gratitude and feeling it. You've helped me feel it more while we've been together. You have been listening to the Church News Podcast. I'm your host, Church News Editor, Sarah Jane Weaver. I hope you have learned something today about The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints by peering with me through the church news window. Please remember to subscribe to this podcast. And if you enjoyed the messages we shared today, please make sure you share the podcast with others. Thanks to our guests, to my producer, Kellyanne Halverson, and others who make this podcast possible. Join us every week for a new episode. Find us on your favorite podcasting channel or with other news and updates about the church on thechurchnews.com.